Uh, so today we will be discussing uh, the cytoskeleton. So up to this point, we've been we've covered amino acids and membranes, and we've looked at enzymes. And so a lot, we're going to be piecing a lot of that together today as we discuss uh, the cytoskeleton and e exploring that through the lens or the context of uh, listeriosis. So listeriosis. Uh, is an infection of the GI tract uh, or of the CNS. And what's really interesting is that listeriosis, it hijacks our cytoskeleton uh, to permit its invasiveness. And it's caused by the bacterium listeria monocytogenes, but typically it's just referred to as uh, listeria. It is another uh, bacterium that's found in the soil, and it's, it's an invasive pathogen, meaning that uh, it's, a, 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 it is, it's incredibly aggressive uh, or active in its uh, infection. And its, uh, its ability to become invasive is mediated by a, a virulence factor. Uh, virulence factors, you'll hear that a lot, uh, perhaps even uh, as... Uh, you, as you read articles about COVID or other infectious diseases, uh, virulence factors are small molecules. They can be proteins, but they're not always. Uh, but there's molecules that uh, aid in the aggressive behavior and the invasiveness uh, of that pathogen. Typically, uh, listeria, occur, uh, listeria infections occur because of consuming raw meat or unwashed vegetables that are contaminated. Um, if, I don't know if you guys remember, about five years ago, there was a huge issue. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was from uh, Listeria. It, there was an, a big issue with Chipotle. Lots of people getting sick from it. I know, we were all really sad when that happened. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, from what I understand, it was actually a few different things. That some of it was E. coli from, uh, I think, the actually the, Litigation, I think, just ended recently because it was an employee who did it on purpose. But uh, some of it was because of unwashed vegetables, uh, and th that led to listeria infections across people from people even in Northern Virginia. Um, thankfully, the prevalence of listeriosis is pretty low. There's only 1,600 infections uh, and 260 deaths annually, uh, and so thankfully, it's uh, the occurrence of it is fairly low. The incident, the incidence rate of it is only 0.3 infections per 100,000. So that mean three infections per, per million people approximately. Uh, so the symptoms and complications. So this is of greatest concern for people with certain risk factors. And typically those risk factors are people who are immunosuppressed, uh, older adults, pregnant women, newborns, and immunocompromised individuals. Uh, and, you know, typically for, uh, especially for pregnant women, they oftentimes uh, designate really strict dietary restrictions, no raw sushi, no deli meat, no uncooked deli meat, um, and no cheese, soft cheeses from unpasteurized milk. And so uh, all, all, typically listeriosis is foodborne and typically it, it emerges or it takes root in people who are uh, immunosuppressed or immunocompromised. Uh, symptoms are host dependent. And so typically in healthy people, uh, it'll lead to uh, diarrhea and fever, which relative to what we're about to read below is fairly insignificant. Uh, in pregnant women, uh, it'll lead to symptoms like fever, muscle aches and diarrhea, but it can also lead to miscarriage, premature delivery, and uh, what's really scary is infection of the fetus. Um, in other high-risk people, uh, whether it's uh, newborns or older adults, uh, it can, again, you'll have fever, muscle ache, and confusion, but it can also lead to convulsions uh, and meningitis. And so that's, that's where it can become fatal in people that are, are immunocompromised. Uh, typically, uh, listeria invades the GI epithelium. Uh, like we discussed for botulism, epithelium is the, uh, it's like a, a, the, the cell sheet layer uh, that lines different mucosal layers of our body. Um, so we have the epithelium and we also have 
the mesenchyme. So typically epithelium are cells that have cell to cell junctions. Uh, and they form these cell sheets that, uh, for example, line our GI tract. Whereas the mesenchyme is typically cells that want to adhere and bind to not other cells, but typically the extracellular environment, the extracellular matrix. And so Listeria leverages the fact that the epithelium are typically celled or uh, a, a sheet of cells that are adjacent to one another, and it will allow cell to cell transmission. And so what ends up happening is that Listeria, the Listeria bacterium will enter into a cell, it'll escape the endosome, it'll enter it through uh, endocytosis, escape the endosome. This is pretty, it's so far pretty similar to uh, the botulism toxin, but this is where it gets different. It'll duplicate and it'll leverage our cytoskeleton to create what we typically call a comet tail that it's actually, I'll show you a video in a second. It'll actually shoot through and push up on the cell membrane and punch a hole through it, but also use the uh, protrusion of the cell membrane to evade immune surveillance. Because if it's wrapped around by our, pl by the, by our plasma membrane as it's pushing through, it's not gonna be detected by our immune cells. Our immune cells are constantly monitoring and surveilling for things that are foreign or things that should not be there. And this is a really elegant way that unfortunately Listeria can avoid uh, immune system surveillance. And so this is a video that I hope works. I think, I think it communicates the point really well. Okay, well, <laughs> anyways, what you'd see is these dots zipping through the cell and you'd even, you might be able to see it on your own computers if uh, after the lecture, but you'd even actually see the listeria pushing through and trying to push the cell membrane to touch an adjacent cell so it can jump through, go to the other cell, replicate and continue to, continue to divide. So, the, it is able to do this, this propulsion of this movement of Listeria that I was hoping to show you as it flies around the inside of our cells is done so because it's leveraging or taking advantage of uh, the cytoskeleton of a cell. And so the cytoskeleton, as you heard in the pre-lecture, is a filamentous network of proteins that are present throughout the entire cytoplasm. Uh, and the cytoskeleton is not only the, the the proteins that we discussed, that were discussed in the pre-lecture, the microtubules, the intermediate filaments and the microfilaments, but it's also the, the proteins that bind and regulate uh, the, the polymerization of cytoskeleton proteins. Um, these proteins, uh, the protein filaments consist of protein monomers. Does anyone think they can venture a guess what monomer means? Yes, sorry? Yeah, like one unit of it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then as, if you can imagine, polymer is many units of it. And so typically for, uh, you could envision proteins as, so as uh, protein subunits that are coming together as, a, as many monomers coming together to form a polymer, many mers, many units. And this uh, polymerization or this uh, addition of many units, many monomers uh, is, occurs via self-assembly into the final structure of the cytoskeleton protein that is also able to disassemble and be destroyed. And so in the cytoskeleton, there's uh, a constant turn, there's a constant polymerization of assembly and disassembly that is constantly in balance and occurring. So the assembly of these filaments uh, are regulated through a few different means. So again, it can, they can all grow or shrink. They can all be assembled or disassembled. And that growth is referred to as pol uh, polymerization. So polymerization is typically regulated by three different things. Uh, the first is the concentration of the monomer. Um, the, as there is more monomer available, more polymerization will occur. And as you can imagine, if there's less monomer available, less polymerization. Uh, the next are accessory proteins. Uh, we'll be discussing that uh, today, specifically for the microtubules and microfilaments. And these will help regulate uh, or almost like a, a, a gas or a break on polymerization. Uh, 
And next, this won't be relevant for today's lecture, it'll be more relevant for future lectures, but phosphorylation is another means by which uh, cytoskeletal protein, cytoskeletal polymerization can be regulated. So typically in polymerization, there's a few different phases. Uh, the first phase is typically referred to, uh, typically referred to as nucleation. Uh, what will happen is uh, in a, uh, in a assembly or in a, a, a group of monomers that are available together, what will end up happening is a few of the monomers will come together and form the first, uh, the first binding or the first association event, the first assembly event. And typically that's the rate limiting step for polymerization. Uh, and so once that happens, after that, uh, the, after nucleation, we have what's called elongation. As the name implies, you have the, fil the uh, cytoskeleton protein filament elongating and undergoing further uh, polymerization that happens at a fairly linear, uh, linear slope. And similar to what we described with almost with the enzyme kinetics, over time we'll reach this steady state where the rate of addition, the rate of assembly and rate of disassembly will even out with each other and the filament length will, uh, will taper off and, steady, and reach a steady state. So at that steady state um, where we have, uh, well, sorry, I'll take, I'll take a step back. So, uh, you know, during the polymerization, we have, we're, we're typically having monomers that are being added on. And uh, a way to consider that, a way to think about that is if you look, if you consider uh, an equation that looks at the change of rate. Yes. Yeah, so nucleation is the initiation of polymerization. That's the first step. And that's typically the rate limiting step. And so if you imagine, uh, usually what ha ends up happening is you have different monomers that uh, they need to associate in a certain orientation. So over time, as these monomers are, uh, are in the same milieu or the same environment area, when they finally orient and are in the right orientation and come together, that's nucleation. That's the first event of the monomers coming together. Once that happens, then polymerization can really take off in the second phase during elongation. Because now you have, uh, now you have the first end and now you have the, the, the minus end. And now you can have, during like the pre, in the pre-lecture, they talked about the minus end and the plus end. And so now you have the ability to have space of the right orientation for more monomers to add on and bind to the, fil the, the protein filament and for it to elongate. And then over time, the rate at which assembly and disassembly is occurring will even out to the same, uh, to the same rate. And that'll be, that'll be the steady state, the last, uh, the last step of polymerization where it evens out. And so typically if you envision uh, an equation that describes the change in monomer, the change in uh, length of the polymer, uh, you can envision it as the change in length over time will have an on rate, something that almost like the, an association uh, constant like we talked about in previous lectures, K on. Uh, and that, as we mentioned earlier, that this polymerization is dependent on the concentration of the monomers, the availability of those monomers. And so you'll have the on rate times the monomer concentration minus the off rate. And so when we talked about steady state, that's where the assembly and disassembly evens out. And so the change in length would be zero here. And so this, st this state at which there's no change in monomer and in, uh, in polymer length, I keep saying monomer and uh, when I wanna say polymer, forgive me, I know it's confusing. Uh, the, the, the point at which the polymer assembly and disassembly is evening out, this change, in this change in length will even out to zero. And so this will permit you to find the monomer concentration at which assembly and disassembly is equal. Okay, and this is, this is an important, this is called the critical concentration. And so if you think about it, 
what that means is that at monomer concentrations that are greater than the critical concentration, you'll have monomer growth because then it's greater than the, it's greater than the, uh, the critical concentration. So at this concentration, the steady state concentration, the rate of assembly and disassembly are zero. And so the length of the polymer is the same. The change is zero. And so that permits us to find this special concentration, the critical concentration at which this, which is it's at steady state. And so any monomer concentration that's above that will permit polymer growth. And any uh, monomer concentration that's below this will lead to filament, uh, fil polymer filament shortening. Does that relationship make sense here? And so the, and so this, this notion of uh, the critical concentration is something that I want you guys to keep in mind as we move through this lecture. Uh, so the first, uh, the, the first group of cytoskeleton, yes. Um, it's something, so it's typically, uh, it's typically something you'd, you'd, uh, find out experimentally, but in, th in this case, it's more, it's, uh, it's an important concept to help you consider what is controlling polymerization as it relates to monomer concentration. So the first, uh, the first group of cytoskeletal proteins that we're going to talk about are microtubules. And typically we just refer to, so microtubules is typically an, an antiquated uh, nomenclature. So typically we just say tubulin. And so here we're going to talk about tubulin and it, as talked about in the pre-lecture, uh, tubulin, form, tubulin forms dimers and these dimers will bind GTP because they are GT, GTP aces. Uh, and so does, can anyone tell me what the pre what the suffix ace implies? Correct. Uh, and so it'll bind to GTP. And as you can see in the image to the right, what'll happen is that as tubulin binds to GTP, so tubulin is the enzyme, GTP is a substrate, uh, it'll it'll actually polymerize to the plus N. And it'll actually form what we call the GTP cap. And so Again, if, when there's enough uh, when there's enough tubulin dimer concentration that's high enough, uh, it has similar to what we talked about in the enzyme in the enzyme lecture. Enzymes have a high affinity typically for their substrate, and so tubulin dimers have a high affinity for GTP. They'll bind to GTP, and if there's enough tubulin GTP uh, concentration available, if it's high enough, it'll polymerize and uh, Add and add on to the existing tubulin filament. And this GTP cap is really important because it helps promote, it, elevate, it uh, will decrease the critical concentration for polymerization. And so there's an incentive, it creates an incentive for more polymerization to occur. But again, we, we don't have, there's only so much tubulin available. It's not uh, a limitless resource. And so as tubulin concentration decreases, what will happen over time is that, again, this is, tubulin is an enzyme. It'll uh, catalyze the reaction to uh, hydrolyze GTP to GDP. And as you lose the GTP cap, you'll have almost entirely a, a tubulin GDP filament and in the absence of the GTP cap, that'll, that'll actually change the critical concentration to go back up. So the, again, the presence of the GTP cap decreases the critical concentration and will incentivize more polymerization. But as the concentration of tubing goes down, you will lose the GTP cap because it's an enzyme that's converting GTP to GDP, guanidine triphosphate to diphosphate. Um, so there's GMP, GDP, GTP, triphosphate, diphosphate, monophosphate. Uh, yes. So you lose the cap because 
the tubulin is catalyzing GTP to GDP. So it go, so it's it's becoming entirely almost a tubulin GDP filament. And once that happens, the KC, the critical concentration, uh, the concentration at which more uh, the concentration at which uh, the steady state is occurring, it'll go up. And then all of a sudden, this, with a combination of this low tubulin concentration here, because we're using it up, and the change in the critical concentration, those two things together uh, will lead to uh, disassembly, a really fast disassembly of the tubulin filament that's typically called catastrophe. I just realized I just walked through it, looking at looking at the slide, not touch, changing things here. So uh, again, once it's in the microtubule, the GTP is almost immediately hydrolyzed, but it's creating, uh, it's changing the critical concentration to facilitate more binding. And this new, uh, the new tubulin GTP, as it binds, it's creating a GTP cap. And as I said, it has a much lower KC at the GTP cap. And once you are catalyzing the reaction to turn GTP to GDP, you lose that advantage of the lower critical concentration and it leads to disassembly. Are there any questions there? Yeah. So these are, so uh, tubulin is a, there are cytoskeleton protein, and we're actually going to talk about one key role that tubulin serves during uh, cell division or during the cell cycle. So hold that thought. Yes, I think I saw you trying to raise your hand up a little earlier. So you go ahead first. Correct. The 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 the, 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 di the tubulin dimer yeah. itself is a GTPase, so it will bind to G to GTP. Okay, but when it binds to GTP, then it becomes the cap, like part of that. So GTP is still there. It's on it's on tubulin, and it's binding to the tubulin filament that's assembling. Right. Yeah. And so that creates the, the presence of a GTP cap because what's, as, as, it's, as, it's, as, as, it is, uh, as, it, as it is assembling, the, G, the presence of a GTP cap. So if you can imagine, uh, when I showed that in the previous slide, I think it was a, or two slides ago, I showed the nucleation. So I showed the first monomers that are coming together. Okay? And so tubulin will be binding to GTP. All right, and as it and when that happens, when you have that those first three, uh, I said elongation, the first the nucleation of those first monomers that coming together, for tubulin that was just for polymerization in general, for uh, for the cytoskeleton. This is now specific to tubulin. Tubulin will bind to GTP, and they'll come together because the monomer concentration at which they uh, that is needed for them to bind is low enough now that it'll promote more assembly, okay? So as they're assembling, they're assembling, that assembly, they're using up tubulin, so now there's less tubulin available. So that'll slow down this reaction. And as the reaction is slowing down, these, uh, so if you can imagine like, uh, so perhaps this might be helpful. So perhaps this was just the entire uh, tubulin, tubulin filament at first. And as it adds on more GTP, tubulin, you'll, you'll have that cap, but they're also still hydrolyzing GTP to GDP. So you'll get a longer filament, but over time, as there's less tubulin available, you'll, you'll eventually use up what's available and no longer have a GTP cap, okay? Once that happens, you lose the advantage of the GTP cap because again, the GTP cap lowers the, the critical, it lowers the threshold. So maybe that's a better way to say it. The critical concentration, think of it as a threshold. This is, so with, with the presence of a GTP cap, it lowers the threshold for the ability for uh, 
what's needed for more monomer to be added on for the polymer to polymer assembly to happen. Okay, it makes it easier, it incentivizes it. But now, as it goes through and uses up tubulin and hydrolyzes GTP to GDP, in the absence of, of the GTP cap, now the threshold has elevated for more polymerization to occur. And now, it's, instead of polymerizing, it's going to start disassembling. Does that make sense now? Uh, we'll talk about that briefly. Okay. That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, before I get to you, did, you had your hand up earlier. That's a great question. So phosphates, phosphate groups are constantly recycled. Um, and so it, that'll, that'll be recycled for, and we'll talk about this a little bit later where, uh, GT, GDP. So after, after the disassembly occurs, GDP will be shuttled off because again, this is an enzyme and its substrate is GTP. It doesn't want to be associated with GDP off of the filament now. So it'll lose GDP. That GDP uh, will be, will uh, through the, through other proteins will receive back that phosphate group and come back. It will become GTP again. And so once it becomes GTP, then another tubulin dimer will want to bind to it and facilitate this polymerization again. And so this polymerization, uh, even though it has a, a, an assembly that's described as catastrophe, there's, there's, turn, there's turnover of this. Yes? So in the situation that uh, people are going to be forming multiple high blends, that that blend is fine. So then the tubing will slow down as the hydrolyzation has been completed. Yes. That's a great way to put it. Yes. Uh, last question, and I got to keep going. Go ahead. I'm sorry, could you speak a little louder? I can hear you well. It will eventually. Yes. Yes, and that goes back to the question over here, talking about what happens to the phosphate. It will disassociate from the GDP and phosphates will be added back to it and it will become GTP again. How to repeat that question one more time for me? They're they're not the same thing. So one one end is two is typically one end is typically tubulin with uh, GTP, and the minus end is typically GDP. And if in the pre lecture we also talked about these uh, protein complexes, these microtubular organizing centers that bind at the minus end. Though that those are typically what's that's typically also present here. So right now we're only just talking about the uh, the balance of this is here, but in a, in a in a little bit we'll be talking about the the context of what's present here. The, those mTOX, the centrosomes that are present at the minus end. So there's actually something here at the like the minus end of the tubulin filament. Does that make sense? So another quality of these tubulin filaments is something that's called dynamic instability. Um, it's not, what's important to remember is that there's not just one tubulin filament in a cell, but there's, uh, a, uh, there's, dozens, there's hundreds of tubulin filaments present. And what typically happens is, like we discussed, as, one, as, a, as, a, as the assembly of one tubulin filament's occurring, it'll eventually reach a point where the GTP cap is gone and all of the GD GTP has been hydrolyzed to GDP. And so now it's gonna disassemble, but there's gonna be other tubulin filaments that are ready to assemble. So what ends up happening, if I can show here, is that the, as it disassembles, other tubulin filaments will begin to polymerize and those, and as these tubulin dimers leave, they'll release GDP, take on GTP and be ready to bind it to another 
tubulin filament to promote polymerization there. And so a great way to illustrate this, to see it in action, and I hope the video works here, there you go, is these are tubulin filaments at the edge of a cell. And you can see some polymerizing and extending out, and you can actually some see retracting back. And so there, there's the assembly and disassembly of these tubulin filaments that are constantly happening. And so they provide, so the way in which uh, this really is important is uh, during cell division. This goes back to the question I received back about what, uh, what in what way, uh, for lack of a better phrase, why does this matter? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what this is critically important during mitosis because we have microtubules that are present throughout the cell and they're assembling and disassembling as you saw in that video a moment ago. And during mitosis, what'll end up happening is that during the phase at which uh, chromosomes are lining up into the middle of the cell and we have uh, the mTOX, those microtubule organizing centers the cent that we call centrosomes. Uh, so mTOX are kind of like a classification of proteins Sorry, I'm staying right in the light. Uh, MTOX are a classification of proteins that help uh, with tubulin organization bind to the minus end. In almost nearly all cells, it is the centrosome. And so during cell division, what ends up happening is the centrosomes duplicate and begin to separate. And so you'll have this, uh, uh, this separation of the centrosomes. And what will also begin to happen is that the microtubules have their minus end connected to the centrosome and their pol polymerizing end will actually at one point reach out and grab onto the middle of the chromosome as they're lining up right in the middle during mitosis, during cell division. And so, the, and so for, uh, to go over the quick nomenclature, uh, unfortunately we have like three names that basically mean the same thing here. So uh, the mTOC, microtubule organizing center, in almost all cells is the centrosome. During mitosis, the centrosome uh, is also called the spindle. Spindle pores are the centrosomes during cell division, during mitosis. And they're also a part of what's called the mitotic spindle. So the mitotic spindle is the, the centrosome, the microtubules, and the chromosomes. And so they're basically all the pieces that are at play during cell division here. And what ends up happening is that the positive end of the microtubules, the polymerizing end, will actually reach out and grab onto the middle of the uh, chromosome, and it's called that's called the kinetic here. And so, what is important to know is that there's actually these really unique macromolecular large complexes that will bind from that will bind to the microtubule at the kin uh, kinetic core right at the middle there of the chromosome, and will hold it there in place. And this is a really cool example of a growing field that's called mechanotransduction. Uh, mechanotransduction is basically how cells perceive mechano signals. And this is a really, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really, I think, fascinating process where uh, actual mechanical forces play a role in the division of cells as they're pulling apart. And that an important part of it is these spindle microtubules that are linked to the very middle. So the the very middle of it, the very middle of the chromosome is called the centromere. And there's, so there's the structure in the middle is called the kinetic core where the microtubule binds to, okay? And so they'll actually pull them apart. And there's a video that, again, I hope I have luck and that it works, that illustrates this really well. So you have microtubules binding to this chromosomes in the middle, and then over time, they'll pull harder and harder and then pull apart the cell and you'll have division. And so microtubules play a pivotal role in cell division. And that's a process that's constantly going because we have cells that are dying, undergoing apoptosis, cells that are replaced, and those cells that are replaced are dividing and growing. And so this is, uh, this, and so after they're pulled apart, typically the intensity of the microtubule fibers is reflective of their, uh, of their quantity, of their assembly, and of their polymerization or disassembly. So you can see they're polymerizing a lot. And then at, right after they pull them apart, the intensity goes away and that's them disassembling and going through the catastrophe to uh, 
to cease that mechanical tension that's uh, permitting cell division. So in cancer, uh, one, of the, one of the key features of cancer is unmitigated cell growth. And so many chemotherapeutic drugs will actually target uh, uh, the polymerization of microtubules. And so one example is uh, vinblastin. And so vinblastin, at, this might seem counterintuitive, it actually causes tubulin aggregation. But if you remember in the pre-lecture, the tubulin structure that forms is a 13 tubulin ring. And what this will end up doing is it will actually make it into a 20 tubulin ring, actually changing the structure of the tubulin filament. And that'll actually change the ability of tubulin to participate in cell division. Because if you remember at the, uh, at the kinetic core, there's these macromolecular structures they're holding on to and binding the tubulin filament. And if the tubulin filament's too large, it's not gonna be able to work. And so this is one way in which uh, you, can tar you can inhibit cell growth by targeting tubulin. Uh, another more intuitive way is per uh, uh, no nicotazole that promotes microtubule depolymerization. And so it tries to inhibit the growth of the tubulin filaments that are so critical to cell division. Uh, and so another, another form of this, uh, another class of this drug is uh, taxol that'll actually stabilize the microtubules. And what was really important at, during cell division was also not only the assembly or the polymerization of these microtubules, but also their uh, disassembly, the ability of these, of these tubulin, these tubulin filaments to stop polymerizing, to disassemble and allow these cells to actually divide. This stabilizes the microtubules in that uh, position where they can't promote cell division any longer. And it'll actually lead to apoptosis. Uh, does anyone remember what apoptosis is from previous lecture? Say it again. Program. Program cell death. I only heard cell death at one point, and so, uh, but that's my hearing. That's not on y'all. Uh, and what's really fascinating is that some of these products, some of these drugs, are have been originally identified in plants, and that's actually typically true for a lot of different drugs that they're first identified in plants and then synthetically derived in the lab as a uh, as a as an alter or a therapy or a therapeutic agent. Um, our next and final uh, cytoskeleton protein is uh, the actin filaments or the microfilaments. Typically, again, uh, we typically refer to these as just actin filaments, uh, and they're different. They're they're similar and different to the tubulin uh, uh, tubulin filaments that we discussed a moment ago. And so one way in which they're different is that actin filaments can actually be stabilized by one end or the other, or both ends can be free. And so you'll typically see growth at both sides. Uh, but, there's gonna, but we're gonna talk about how one end has, uh, per, one end typically undergoes polymerization a little bit faster. And another thing is that we talk about how uh, tubulin is a GTPase, actin filaments are an ATPase. And so I will do my best to not confuse that while I'm saying it in the lecture. And I'll also uh, try and be forgiving if we confuse that together. But actin filaments are an ATPase. And what's really important to know is that, um, so when we were talking about tubulin, we talked about how they were uh, free dimers that were, when not bound to the tubulin filament, they were just tubulin dimers. So for actin, uh, free actin that's not bound to the filament is typically called G-actin or globular actin. That's an that's a easy way to remember it. And the, fil the actin filament is typically referred to as F-actin or filamentous actin. And so when, you're, when, you feel, when you typically hear actin referred to, it's either referred to as G-actin or F-actin or a way to try and denote degree of polymerization is a ratio of G-actin to F-actin. Um, one final thing is uh, you'll also see that it's labeled as a, a barbed and pointed end here. Uh, that is another antiquated way of uh, referring to the ends of actin filaments. Uh, it, was originally, it was originally dubbed that way because when looking at actin filaments under a microscope or under uh, an electron microscope, one end looked pointed and one end looked barbed. And so the scientists who discovered it said, I'm just gonna call them barbed and pointed ends. But now we have better nomenclature 
to describe them as negative and positive ends of the actin filament. So for actin polymerization, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can have polymerization at both ends. However, the positive end grows faster than the negative end. And that's again, because of the critical concentration. Uh, the positive end has a lower critical concentration. And uh, uh, I'll continue, I'll try and re continue to refer to that as a threshold. So there's a lower threshold for polymerization at the positive end than at the negative end. It's still happening there, but it's happening far faster at the positive end because the threshold is lower. Um, and the, in addition to that, uh, the ATPase activity is also something to keep in, keep in mind here that the positive end, because it is, uh, because there's more binding occurring or more polymerization occurring at the positive end, the positive end will have more ATP monomers than the negative end. So again, uh, the, the, this is a substrate and it has an affinity, uh, actin has an affinity to bind to ATP and it will also after it's, uh, it'll also hydrolyze ATP to ADP. Just like we talked about with tubulin, tubulin is a GTPase, it'll bind to GTP and hydrolyze it to GDP. And so the ATP hydrolysis uh, is part of the reason why this difference exists at the positive end versus the negative end. And so just like with the, just like with the tubulin filament, uh, actin filaments, F-actin has a, has a positive end that's mostly ATP, uh, that has more ATP actin bound to it. And that presence there will actually lower the threshold. That's why the positive end has, uh, will have more polymerization occurring than at the negative end. And what's really different here is that while there's the, cata the catastrophic, catastrophic disassembly of tubulin filaments, Actin is a little different. Actin will have what's called treadmilling. And so what'll end up, oh, sorry, forgive me. What'll end up happening here is that as at the, ne at the negative end where actin filaments are coming off and disassembling there, they will release the ADP. And we'll talk about uh, what protein facilitates them losing ADP. Uh, they'll lose ADP, uh, will bind to ATP, because again, they have an affinity for it because they're the enzyme ATP and then be recycled back to the positive end. And so this recycling process is called treadmilling because as you can imagine, it just goes around. Uh, I'll stop, oh, good. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. It's not phosphorylated. So that's a very good question. Th what's happening here is not a phosphorylation event. So when, actin, when the actin ADP comes off at the negative end, typically what will happen is that it will lose ADP. Um, this is an enzyme that has affinity and affinity for its substrate, ATP. ADP, is, it does not want it, to, it has a lower affinity for that and will not want to remain bound to it. And there are, uh, we'll talk about these uh, proteins called uh, nucleotide exchange factors that facilitate the release of ADP here. And so now you have a free G-actin monomer. Because it's an enzyme for ATP, it has a high affinity to want to bind to ATP. And so it'll, and because ATP is present throughout the entire cell, it'll eventually find an ATP. And this is happening at an incredibly fast rate. It'll find ATP, so that's the color difference here. And the globular ATP, globular act, G actin with, bound with ATP is available to find again. So one thing that I did not mention that I forgot too is that actin is the most abundant protein in a cell. Uh, and it is also, to my knowledge, the most highly conserved protein in biology. And so it, it's, this activity here has been conserved for a long time. And because of its high, uh, because of its abundant, because of its abundant concentration, uh, 
Um, there's constantly ATP available for it to bind to, constantly available actin to bind here. So one of the important things that actin filaments are involved with are uh, cell motility, cell contractility. So cells, uh, not all cells, uh, I'm, I'm biased because the cell I like does this. Uh, there are groups of cells that like to interrogate and feel their environment and they'll pull and stiffen to match their environment. And actin is what helps facilitate this. Cells also typically want to move. If there's, um, if they have a, a, a receptor for something that they really like, and if they sense that, that the thing that the receptor recognizes is over there, they will use their actin filament to walk across and pull and literally crawl. Uh, and actually, if you think, this is actually kind of a, a helpful way to think about it. Like it, you can, this facilitates the crawling because what's happening is actin is coming off and coming over there and helping push the cell or help the cell reach out that way. So it's, it's aiding in cell mobility because what's happening is actin's coming off, coming over here. Actin's coming off, coming over here. With, in, in the process of coming over here, losing ATP, getting ATP, binding over to the positive end. Does that make sense? I provide long-winded answers, I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? I saw another hand a moment ago, yes. Uh, so the limiting factor for, that's a good question. So for actin polymerization, it's a little different. So, um, you know, we talked earlier about how for uh, cytoskeleton filament polymerization, the right limiting step is nucleation. Um, this will probably be different for different cells. So I should probably caveat it with that. I'm thinking, so the cell of, my, the cell of interest for me is fibroblasts, how they are constantly pulling and moving and stretching and contracting. It's a constantly, it's a constantly evolving process where the honestly the rate limiting step for perhaps for fibroblasts is that uh, the speed at which this process can occur. Um, for I'll leave it right there. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, okay, we just have five more minutes. I'll try and see if we can get through this today. Um, so. There are regulatory mechanisms that control the availability of actin. Like I mentioned, it's the most abundant protein in a cell. Um, and if we did not have any regulatory mechanisms that controlled actin monomer concentration, we would just constantly be having actin, actin filaments that are basically busting through the plasma membranes. And so there, uh, over time, regulatory mechanisms have come up that help control the availability or the, uh, the mo actin monomer concentration. Uh, one of them is profilin. Profilin helps with shuttling actin. So that treadmilling, uh, the treadmill, the treadmilling that I talked about on the previous slide, that's in one way facilitated by profilin because it helps to shuttle actin, the actin monomer. But what's also important is that it helps promote nucleotide exchange. And so the, uh, the loss, the, it, it'll help with the removal of ADP from the actin monomer as it's treadmilling and uh, actin will then subsequently find ATP and be ready for, uh, to participate again in actin polymerization. Uh, thymosin is a, so here we go, so profilin. So profilin will bind uh, to, in blue is actin monomer ADP. Uh, and so it'll remove the, ADP and it'll bind to ATP. And so then we have free actin monomer available that has ATP bound to it. But again, if we have so much available, it will, will have spontaneous uh, polymerization of actin filaments. So thymosin is a buffer that'll actually uh, uh, will help buffer out the free available actin monomer concentration. And in the right scenario, when there's a, a need, when, the, when there's actin polymerization ready, uh, the thymosin will release the actin monomer. Uh, profilin will shuttle at an actin monomer with ATP on it to the actin filament and facilitate actin polymerization. Uh, there are also other forms in actin filament regulation. Uh, one of them is cofilin. Uh, it's a, it buffers out 
uh, the ADP actin monomer. So again, in, that's in, so the ADP actin is in blue, ATP uh, is in green. And so the uh, cofilin is a buffer for ADP actin monomers. Uh, Jolsolin is an actin severing protein. And finally, alpha actinin and filamin are cross-linking proteins. These are not covalent cross-linkings like, uh, like with disulfide bonds. These are actually alpha actinin, for example, is an actual protein that will bridge across two different actin filaments. Did you have a question? Okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there are actual uh, toxins that are used to look at actin filament uh, stable uh, actin filament structure. And this is one that's commonly used. That's called uh, phalloidin. It comes from the phallotoxin from the death cat mushroom. And what it does is it stabilizes the actin filament. So the actin filament will be kept at its uh, level of polymerization. And we can actually look at what the actin filament looks like in a cell uh, as a way to look at perhaps at its degree of contractility or as also just a way to try and also stand for the cell if we're trying to look at the structure of the cell. Uh, because it's a great way to also get just like an outline of a cell. Um, cytochalasin, cytochalasin is an actin filament destabilizer that's also derived from mushrooms. And so it'll actually, uh, if you wanted to try and interrogate what's happening with a cell, uh, the void of its actin filament cytoskeleton, that's a way to, to do it. Uh, this will probably be our last slide for today. I feel like we're so close. Uh, so... As I mentioned earlier, actin filaments facilitate cell crawling, the cell mobility, cell motility, their movement. And there are three ways by which they do that. Uh, one is lamellopodia. Uh, that is a sheet-like movement. My videos are not cooperating today. Uh, so I'll just point to these different ones. Uh, lamellopodia are uh, sheet-like, uh, sh lamelli sheet, podia feet. She like feet that uh, it describes one way in which cells migrate or cells move. Uh, pseudopodia is another one. Uh, does any, can anyone think of an organism that moves with pseudopodia or that's been associated with pseudopodia? What do you say? You got it. Uh, an, an amoeboid like action. But what's really interesting is that uh, mammalian cells have now recently, I think it was like two years ago, uh, by a professor up at Drexel, have been described now to have a pseudopodia-like movement. Uh, they'll actually wrap their cytoskeleton around their nucleus and use it as a piston to uh, promote movement. Um, and finally is philopodia. That's how the cell that I study, fibroblasts, that's how they typically move. They have these uh, phyllo, like filament, uh, filament-like feet that stick out and reach and grab onto their environment and pull and reach and uh, move across. And so all of this is mediated by their actin filaments. So we will stop there um, and we'll pick up the lecture at this point. Thank you for your time.